Uh, hi, I'm Kevin Finner, and I um, work here at the National Academies. I direct our committee on science, engineering, and public policy. And with um, Jay Lloyd and Dan Sarowitz from ASU, I edit the journal Issues in Science and Technology. You'll find some copies out on the table. And uh, I just want to say, um, as a bit of inspiration to get us launched, oh, just a little practical information. There is um, Wi-Fi here in the building. There's no password. If you just open your browser, you'll immediately be taken to the page and be able to log in. And the restrooms are out this way and around to the right. I think that's all the essential information I have. Um, and just as a little bit of inspiration, if you don't know the National Academy of Sciences, um, we were chartered in 1863 um, by Abraham Lincoln. And I think it's a bit of inspiration that in the middle of the Civil War, um, Abraham Lincoln decided to help create the National Academy of Sciences, where scientists would provide guidance to the government on issues where their expertise was relevant. And he also um, signed into law the legislation that created the land-grant university system to educate scientists and engineers for the future. So I think considering what was happening around him, the amount of vision and foresight that he was able to exercise in that circumstance, I uh, hope will be an inspiration to us all, and, um, and particularly to those of you who write science fiction and are helping us try to keep our eyes on the future and above the immediate phrase. So thank you all with that. I'm going to introduce Ed Finn from ASU and the Hieroglyph Project to get us started. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin, and uh, welcome, everybody. Excited to be here and to see so many of you here. Uh, so I'm the director of the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. I'm an assistant professor there as well. And I'm the co-editor of the Hieroglyph Anthology. Uh, and today, our event, Can We Imagine Our Way to a Better Future, is using that book as a launch pad for a series of conversations about big ideas that are technically feasible, things that we could actually do. Uh, and we're also using it as a launch pad to think about not just what we can do, but what we should do. This event uh, is something that actually started at Future Tense in a lot of ways in a conversation that uh, Neil Stevenson, who I'll be introducing momentarily, had with the president of ASU, Michael Crow, in 2011. Uh, and so it's really nice to come back and do another event with Future Tense as we reach this new milestone in the project. Future Tense is a partnership between Slate Magazine, the New America Foundation, and Arizona State University, which looks at emerging technologies and their implications for policy and society. Uh, in addition to doing events like this, Future Tense has a channel on Slate. Uh, and uh, we're also uh, delighted that this event is being co-hosted by Issues in Science and Technology, which is a forum for discussion of public policy related to science, engineering, and medicine. Uh, and thanks again to the National Academy of Sciences for hosting us. A couple of quick uh, moderation notes. Uh, this event is going to be live streamed, so keep that in mind when you throw things at the stage. Uh, please wait for the microphone if you're going to ask questions. And uh, for all those Zoe Lofgren fans, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, she was unable to make it today. Or Zoe? Zoe Lofgren? Uh, so uh, I'm afraid she couldn't be here today. So uh, let me introduce Neil and get us started. For those of you who don't know, uh, Neil Stevenson is the New York Times bestselling author of the three-volume historical epic, The Baroque Cycle, and a number of novels, including Reem D, Cryptonomicon, The Diamond Age, Snow Crash, Anathem, and the forthcoming Seven Eves. Uh, he lives in Seattle, Washington. Neil? Thanks, Ed, and thanks to, to everyone for coming. Um, this will, I guess, be uh, take the form of the, the triannual uh, report uh, to the, uh, the, the shareholders uh, of, uh, uh, of, of this initiative. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to dwell a lot on the origin story. I think it's been, been covered. Uh, um, it's already been alluded to a few times. We were at a conference uh, uh, on synthetic biology uh, and uh, uh, Crow and I strayed from the uh, the, the, the script and um, and ended up having this conversation about uh, about doing big stuff, getting big stuff done, and and why we don't seem to be uh, 
succeeding at that anymore. And uh, the result was uh, an experiment in fiction, uh, which uh, has just recently been published in the form of the big blue book that you can see uh, copies of around here called uh, the Hieroglyph Anthology. Um, and uh, it presents a number of, of uh, ideas uh, from various science fiction writers about uh, interesting uh, uh, kind of world-changing projects that might be undertaken in a reasonably optimistic uh, vision, or at least non-pessimistic, non-dystopian uh, vision of the, the future. Um, so um, I thought uh, I would use um, most of my 15 minutes to, to talk about some, uh, some things that we learned, or at least some, some observations that I've made over the course of this, this project. And I basically got... got Got three sort of new things to throw into the into the mix here. Um, one um, came up actually yesterday evening at, at dinner, uh, and <clears throat> I thought I would just uh, air it out um, since it kind of struck me as an interesting idea. That was uh, the idea that it, it wouldn't hurt maybe to try to come up with some negative hieroglyphs. We've got a whole. Uh, a whole book now of, of, of relatively positive ideas, but the, the point has been made. It turns out that dystopia has its defenders. Uh, and uh, so we've heard from a number of people giving you know, completely reasonable arguments in favor of writing dystopian fiction. And the, the one that stands out, of course, is 1984 and the concept of Big Brother, which uh, uh, in a way uh, has been a highly productive uh, and socially beneficial negative uh, image, uh, negative hieroglyph uh, that everyone kind of understands and understands it would be good to to avoid. So, so maybe the next uh, maybe the next uh, go around could could be uh, unremittingly dark. Um, the um, um, the the guidelines that uh, the writers were working with uh, were to avoid as much as possible the, the three H's, those being um, hyperspace, holocausts, and hackers. Um, the, uh, the, the theory was that um, we wanted the, the, the stories in the, the book to feature things that uh, scientists and engineers could plausibly undertake in their lifetimes. Uh, and so we wanted to avoid any kind of uh, super technologies that violate the known laws of physics uh, or that we, we didn't want to give people uh, excuses to not do anything. So for example, in my story, which is about a tall tower, uh, the tower is made out of steel and we don't use any fancy new uh, materials. Uh, why not? Well, uh, uh, the, there's been, people have been talking about space elevators for a long time, but the conversation always gets to the point where it is pointed out that we need new materials, super strong materials, to make a space elevator. And at that point, everyone kind of stops. Um, so, uh, so no hyperspace, um, no, no holocausts, small h, uh, is just a way of saying that we wanted to avoid uh, the dystopian kind of tone that's taken over a lot of science fiction, particularly in uh, video games and uh, film and, and television. Um, and then No Hackers uh, was a way of saying that instead of uh, writing stories where people find clever ways to exploit existing technologies, technologies that are kind of big, immutable things that were created by other uh, sort of faceless entities, uh, that, that they should kind of be the faceless entities them, themselves making the, the big new technologies that maybe a next generation of, of hackers would, would, would play with. Um, and uh, what we, the, the result uh, of the experiment is that uh, 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 our writers were uh, happy to, uh, to do without um, the first two H's, but that the, the sort of hacker narrative is pretty unkillable. There's still a strong, uh, a strong interest uh, and, and kind of affection uh, for the idea of of technological innovation as being the province of ragtag groups of outsiders, um, and working with uh, working with kind of disruptive technologies like uh, like drones and three D printers. Um, so, um, and that's all well and good, but I'll just point out that um, 
Uh, that's not where most actual innovation really occurs. It tends to occur in giant corporations and, uh, and, and government-funded labs and, and, and other such uh, institutions. Um, and so um, I don't have a, a, a great conclusion to draw here, but I think it's noteworthy and maybe some food for thought during the rest of the day that that uh, people no longer seem to be looking toward the big institutions uh, as being places where creative uh, technological thinking can occur. Um, so, um, um, so food for thought there. Uh, the, the third and last uh, point that uh, I wanted to make um, is uh, something that I talked about a bit in a, a little piece that was published in Slate a couple of days ago, so you can find it there if you want a somewhat better articulated version of what I'm about to say. But the um, um, I, uh, for most of my life, have, have assumed that the scarce resource, the, the reason that I don't have a personal jet pack or uh, uh, the opportunity to travel to Mars or live on a space station is is clever ideas uh, and that we don't have enough ideas um, it's a it's a kind of self-flattering thing to believe because I see myself as being one of the clever ideas people uh, and it's 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 gratifying to think that um, uh, we live in a kind of 19th century patent office vision uh, of, of the universe where uh, you've got uh, inventors uh, sitting there with their, their better mousetrap uh, waiting for the world to uh, be to pass to their, their door. Um, the, uh, um, what, what, I've, what I've learned uh, as time has gone on is that um, nobody cares about your clever idea. There's lots and lots of clever ideas. There's a glut of, of patents and um, um, if you actually want to move beyond merely coming up with an idea and maybe uh, getting a patent, uh, you have to raise money. And raising money is a, uh, an exhausting and dispiriting uh, process. Not everyone uh, who has, is good at inventing things is good at, at raising money. And, um, and so many are the people who've invented clever ideas only to spend the next couple of decades of their lives uh, applying for grants or, or trying to create startups and, and pitching their idea to, to VCs. Um, so if you are in that life, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in that, that world of, uh, of searching for, for capital uh, to, to, to make your idea a reality, it's very easy to, uh, to come to the uh, conclusion that the scarce resource is money, that, that what we want is, is capital, and only if we had a little bit more of it, uh, we would be able to turn some of these ideas into reality. Um, if you zoom back and look at the larger macroeconomic picture, that appears not to be the case. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of of research and, and statistics uh, suggesting that we are awash in capital, uh, that capital isn't worth very much because it's so plentiful, that corporations and wealthy individuals are just sitting on top of great big piles of, of cash and not feeling motivated to invest that money in new ventures. Um, so uh, to, to figure out why that's the case is, is beyond my scope. Um, uh, it, but um, based on uh, sort of anecdotal uh, evidence and uh, conversations that I've had uh, recently with, uh, with people who actually know about this stuff, um, it appears that, that what is lacking is uh, the kind of, of person who can be entrusted with uh, a big pile of money uh, over a, a period of, of several years. And, uh, and, and people in that, in that category need to uh, occupy kind of an intersection uh, on, on a Venn diagram, which turns out to be a pretty small intersection. You've got one circle, uh, which is people who are uh, technically sophisticated and passionate enough about an idea that they're willing to uh, devote uh, something like five years of their lives to, uh, to pursuing it <clears throat> full time to the exclusion of other professional activities and accepting 
the risk that at the end of that five years it may fail uh, and they may not they, they won't get those those years back um, so uh, passion dedication we all kind of know that those are uh, required uh, attributes for <clears throat> an entrepreneur uh, but if um, if someone like that is is going to be entrusted with a significant significant amount of money by uh, by a, a capitalist, in the sense of somebody who has the uh, the wherewithal <coughs> to deploy capital, uh, they also need to have uh, a number of other skills uh, associated with with business management. They need to um, have the the kind of social skills needed to lead an organization and inspire people and get them working together well. They need to um, have enough basic knowledge of business to read a spreadsheet and uh, and to sort of operate uh, an organization in a in a competent manner. Um, they need to to have the ability to hire people and when necessary to to fire people. Um, and to keep the, uh, the organization moving forward on a coherent path. So um, these are all the attributes that we associate with, with CEOs. And by that, I don't mean the CEO of a giant company like Home Depot or something, but uh, CEOs of small uh, tech startups. Um, there are lots of people right now uh, in the Silicon Valley um, who are uh, who uh, whose aspiration is to to be a CEO in exactly that sense and who uh, are getting involved in various um, startups uh, Peter Thiel has uh, has recently leveled a, a criticism of Silicon Valley culture to the effect that it breeds a kind of attention deficit disorder among entrepreneurs where if your your plan is to uh, to fail quickly um, you, 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 may, you may fail so quickly uh, that you never succeed at anything and you don't devote yourself to a specific project long enough to actually uh, get anything done. Um, so I don't claim to have an answer uh, to, to this problem, uh, but uh, uh, in, in a general spirit, as I said, of, of issuing the, the triannual or quadrennial uh, report of, of this, this project, uh, uh, I thought it might be useful to uh, nudge the steering wheel in a slightly new direction and and provide some other uh, some other themes that uh, maybe we could be attending to during the the various uh, panels uh, that that we're going to have have today. Um, so uh, with that, with one minute and thirty two seconds remaining in my fifteen uh, minutes, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to cede my time, as they say. Uh, locally, and uh, we can move on to uh, the next phase. Thanks.